Hello, my friend, how are you doing? And uh, welcome to the session on thesis writing, where I'm going to be talking about Sounds Like a Thesis, um, the ebook that I published together with um, Claire Hindley, a good friend of mine a while ago. Um, this will be a very long session and a very long video. So if you are particularly interested in, in the commentary of a, uh, a certain section of the ebook or a certain stage of the thesis writing, don't forget to have a look on the menu here or on the description of the video where you're going to be able to fast forward and, 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 and move on to different sections. Okay. But the idea is to go through the content of the ebook and all the different stages. It's going to start with the conceptualization of the idea and finish up all the way with a um, thesis colloquium. So do's and don'ts of, of each chapter and, you know, based on my own experience as a student, but also as a supervisor and, um, and yeah, so let's get started. Um, so the idea, just in a nutshell, of the ebook, um, the ebook, which by the way is uh, freely available for download at liveinnovation.org, which is my education slash research website. Um, and again, you can download it there for free. And I've been using it with my uh, bachelor's and master's students, and it's proven to be quite helpful for them. So wherever you are in the world, I hope it's helpful for you as well. And, and in case it is, I'd love to hear from you as well and, um, and know where you are. So I tried to write it in a really user-friendly way, in a very accessible way. And since I'm very passionate about music and I try to put music in almost everything I do, all the chapters are labeled after songs. So the beginning of the thesis, for example, is Welcome to the Jungle, excuse me, by the Guns N' Roses. Um, and it ends with The Scientist uh, from, from Coldplay. And the entire list of, of songs referring to the different sections of the thesis, you can download the playlist on Spotify. Also, in, in the end of each chapter, there's additional songs that I, that I recommend as well. Also, the, the list of the, um, for the Spotify playlist will also be available in the description of the video here on YouTube, so you can, so you can click on it and follow it as well. There's also a, a, another video series, which is only for, for thesis writing. You also find it here on the um, on the live innovation channel. So there's plenty of 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 content on thesis writing that I've gathered throughout the years to help the students. And this same series is also available on Spotify as well. So if you find you find it better to listen to it almost like a, a podcast, you can find it also on on Spotify. And um, and uh, it's just another way. Also on Spotify, you can also see the video if that is of any interest um, for you. So before we get on, we move any forward, um, what I'd like to make really clear is that these are my own personal uh, suggestions, recommendations. There's not a single way of writing a thesis. So all of these suggestions, again, they're my own. And don't forget to discuss them with your own supervisor um, and, you know, different people have different opinions and there's not one size fits all. Okay. So make sure that, um, that nevertheless you discuss, um, any of these issues that we'll discuss today with your supervisor. All right. So first of all, what is a, what is a, uh, thesis? Yeah. Welcome to the jungle. Let's get started with, uh, with your thesis project. Um, what is a, th what is a uh, thesis? In a nutshell, a thesis is essentially a research project that you're going to do on a topic that you have um, developed and you're going to follow certain um, academic rules of writing and also of conducting and analyzing your research. And you're going to write that in a document which will should follow the guidelines of your institution. So different institutions have different guidelines. I also recommend you be familiar with the one from the university that you're, um, that you're signed up to. Uh, for okay, so um, traditionally thesis follows the the structure that you see here on the screen: introduction, lit review, methodology, results, conclusion, managerial recommendations, and it finishes up with a few limitations. Um, it can change a little bit according to the different style of of your thesis. So, for example, if you're doing a large systematic review, it will be slightly different. Also, another thing which I forgot to mention. Um, all of my suggestions here are mostly applied for um, thesis and management related courses. So if you're doing, uh, if you're writing a thesis in biology or chemistry, um, there could be lots of differences. So please keep in mind that most of my recommendations here are for students in uh, management related courses. Okay. 
Um, all right, so before you start, what are some of the things that you should keep in mind that I would recommend? The first one is to always keep in mind that you're writing your thesis for someone to read. Yeah, keeping the reader in mind is really, really important because very often things are clear for us, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be clear for the reader. Yeah, and um, you also should bear in mind that the, the supervisor and the other additional reviewers, when they're reading your thesis, they're going to be busy with other things. So it's not like they have all of the time in the world to read your work. So what they're going to do is they're going to find a gap during their day to go through your work. And if they get lost, it's going to compromise everything that you did. And obviously, the evaluation of your work. So you got to make sure to keep in mind of guiding through the reader. Of, and I'll give you a few tips along the way on the presentation today. But there's a lot of small things, like for example, in the beginning of every chapter, reminding what the research aim is in order to try and investigate, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, and then you do this in the beginning of the literature review, in the beginning of the methodology, in order to address the aim, which was to so on. So, Here's the methodology on the on the results section before you analyze in order to blah 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 this thesis will analyze and so on and so on and then you sort of review you remind the 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 reader what the aim of the of the of the thesis is it's also always good as well in the end of each chapter to make a link to the following chapter so these small tips they play a big they play a big role okay so make sure to take the reader by the hand don't let the reader lost, otherwise it's going to compromise your work. So try to, to work on structure and format. And by formatting, um, your thesis has to look good. And what I'm trying to say with that is pay attention to details. Because if you just open a thesis, then you can immediately build an impression of how much you took care of detail. And if you don't care, why should the reviewer? Right, the reviewer should have a look quickly at your thesis and and immediately feel that you that you had a lot of attention to detail, that you care, that you thought of every single detail, that you started chapters with uh, important relevant quotes about your topic, that you kept all of the fonts the same and the sizes of of headers and subheaders, that you made some things italic, that the tables look nice, that. They're not massive gaps that if you build graphs, they, they look good, that, that you summarize your findings. So the overall structure will play a huge role. Always keep in mind, if you don't care, why should the reader, right? And try to build this first impression. First impressions, they always matter. Um, the other thing to keep in mind before you, you start is that um, you're not going to finish your thesis in a week. You won't finish it in two weeks. Depending if it's a master's program or PhD program, it will take much longer. So it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. So make sure to structure your time to build a nice work environment. Try to make it a nice routine for yourself. Try to make it fun, yeah? Everything in life, if it's fun, if it's enjoyable, it will come across in the quality of your work. So um, you wanna make sure that you that you do that, okay? Um, another common question that students ask me, because I work in a university of applied sciences, so we often do projects with companies. Should you write your thesis in collaboration with a company? My stand on that, and again, it's a personal stand, is that you should do it as long as it's of your interest. Very often what happens is that students will write thesis with a company with the hope that they will get a job in the end. And then sometimes they do on a topic that is not really what they would like to do, and they, they don't get the job in the end. So they're disappointed because the topic was not what they wanted and they didn't get the job. So to make sure that you don't run this risk, um, be selfish. It's your project. It's not anybody else's project. So if it suits you and if it suits your interest, fine. Yeah. Also, very often companies will do this to try and get free consulting and sort of see what they, uh, you know, how they find your results. So um, you can have good experiences, but I've also seen many negative experiences. So consider that. And the main thing is be a little bit selfish. It's your project. It's not your supervisor's project. It's not your, the company's project. It's yours. So if it appeals to you, then you should consider it. If not, think twice, perhaps. Okay. All right, so um, let's move on to how to develop an idea, yeah, and, and it all starts by trying to research a, a thesis 
idea. So how do we come up with ideas for, for that are valuable for a thesis? Um, what I would recommend to you is try to strike a balance between two things, yeah, which is your passion and your relevance. Seems a little bit cheesy, sounds cheesy, I, I know, but passion is really truly your interest. So let me give you an example. I did my bachelor's, my, my master's and PhD researching in the context of tourism, which I find it interesting, but after a while I sort of lost the passion and I, I went back to you know, reflecting, what am I really passionate about? And what I identified is that I really like live hedonic experiences, music concerts, football games, Formula One races. I like to feel emotions and I like experiences, kind of like tourism, but tourism is way more diluted. Um, and especially music being one of very strong passion for myself. And if you choose something that you're really interested in, the motivation just comes so naturally. So why would you do in, in anything else? Very often students feel the need of, of addressing topics that sounds, I don't know, serious or that sounds, um, do you know what I mean? So uh, they, they feel like they have to include blockchain because everybody's speaking about blockchain or they feel like they have to include something with finance or investment because that sounds, that makes them look smart. Not necessarily, yeah? Of course that you have to find something which is relevant that would appeal either for the academia or that would appeal for the industry that someone would have an interest in reading your work. But essentially it has to, to balance with, with, you know, with your passion. So basically you would be sort of balancing pleasure but also with a sense of purpose, something which is relevant. So for passion, you know, if it's not clear for you what you like, one thing which I always tell the students is, have a look at your browsing history. <laughs> if you remove the, if you keep the things that are legal, let's put it this way, or socially acceptable, um, what are the things that you're not naturally drawn to? Um, what are you always looking at? Is it food? Is it music? Is it sports? Is it fashion? Is it tech? Is it literature? Is it whatever it is you can you can develop a, a project around it yeah and relevance um you can do it with further research you know uh, uh, reading the news and what are the latest things that are coming out and what are the latest innovations what are challenges that are out there where what are people complaining about or what are people celebrating or how's it impacting the environment we know that automation sustainability these are core topics that are of big relevance. So it's not a surprise that, for example, on live innovation on my site, um, I'm discussing artificial creativity and I'm getting more and more into sustainable consumption in the context of entertainment, because those are things that I find a sense of purpose, but also combine it with my with my passion. So try to, to consider these two factors. Once you know what these two factors are, and you want to start framing your idea, um, one, one thing to do is to sort of think in terms of context and think in terms of theory. Now, context is the easy part because context would be like a prototype, uh, uh, oh, sorry, a product type, um, a market, a, a consumer group. So let's say that you're really into, I don't know, electric cars or luxury hotels or um, hip hop or a uh, certain type of food or that's all context. And usually that's the easy part to identify. And so the idea is that you would narrow down your context to be really specific. So let's say that um, you want to do your project on, um, let's say, uh, music festivals or rock or, or pop festivals. So that's a context. Um, in Europe, let's say, that's limiting the, the market or in Germany, for example, where I'm at at the moment. Um, and you want to look at the behavior of, uh, I don't know, senior consumers. So senior consumers that are going to music, to music festivals. That's all context. You're not going to write your literature review about senior consumers or about music festivals. You need to combine that with theory, which are theoretical concepts that you're applying to that context, which will help you further understand something in depth. So for example, you could, the example that I was giving before, you could look at risk perception. So risk perception and decision-making process. So senior consumers, when they say, oh, I would love to go to a festival um, during their decision-making process, what are the risks that they encounter? What are the some push and pull factors? Now we're combining theory and context. And when you combine those two, you have a defined research aim, which is what you really want to, the, the way that you would like to frame um, the idea that you have for, for your research, okay? So 
the main mistake here that students often make is when they come and all they have is just context. That's not enough. Yeah. And for the theory, please don't be like the students that will come to us and say, hey, I'm doing a, a research on a topic such and such. Can you tell me what theoretical concepts I should include? That's also not the way, not the way to go. So um, the main the, the main suggestion that I have here, and there's no way out, just reading the existing literature. So if you look at similar works, what are they writing on the theoretical backgrounds? What are these concepts that you see recurrently? Yeah? And they'll give you lots of indications as to um, how to frame um, your initial idea, okay? So remember, just quickly summarizing, remember passion, personal passion, and relevance. Relevance for the industry, relevance for academia, when you're combining these elements, think in terms of context and narrowing that down for product type, for consumer group, or for market. The more that you narrow, the more clear it is the boundaries of the context of your of your work. But also, um, very very important combining that with theory, which will indicate exactly what you are investigating. Yeah, so theoretical concepts will be things like risk, attitude, um, choice overload, or any other similar context c concepts okay all right and once you combine those you're going to frame that into your research aim so your research aim will be simple sentences uh, 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 two sentences maximum that are going to say exactly what your research is about so that's one of the first things that i ask my students to define and it should be in the tip of their tongue they should know exactly what the research aim is about yeah and again the research aim will combine those two elements which is context and theory once you know those two it will be very straightforward to um to write um your research aim which will say exactly what your thesis is about so to give you an, a quick um suggestion something which i do normally when i'm reviewing a thesis and i know that many other colleagues will do the same is if you just want to get a quick summary of someone's work you have a look quickly of their research aim, which is what did they say that they would set out to do. And then you sort of flip to the end to the results. What do they actually do? Those two have to match what you propose to do and what you actually what you actually did. And when you're judging, for example, the uh, suitability of your methodology, you go back to your research aim. How does that methodology suit that research aim? So the research aim is really, really, really important. And um, don't rush in defining your research aim. I would suggest um, taking some time to make sure that it's really clear, really well defined, because the aim will dictate lots of choices in the future of your of your work. All right. Um, following the research, uh, following the the research aim, you have your research objectives. So the objectives are step by step of what you're gonna do in order to fulfill that aim. And there's more or less of a format that works, which is your first objective is to review the current literature and blah, blah, blah. Then you have your research objectives that are related with data collection. And you finish off with a research objective that has um, managerial recommendations. So to provide managerial recommendations and so on. So the number of, of objectives that you have will depend a lot on how many data collection points that you would have. But the main thing that you should keep in the back of your mind is if you fulfill all, all of those objectives, um, will you have fulfilled your research aim? If the answer is yes, then they are well laid out, okay? All right, so those were all initial considerations and also on developing a thesis idea. Now let's go on to individual chapters, starting with the introduction chapter. Um, again, there's not a formula on how to write these chapters, and these are my recommendations. And the introduction chapter is perhaps the only chapter that I can sort of suggest to you a little formula of what to do or formula in terms of format, yeah? On how you should write the introduction um, chapter. And before we get to that, um, sometimes I know that different supervisors have different um, uh, suggestions as to when you should write um, the uh, introduction chapter. Some will say, we'll leave that to the end as the last thing for you to write. Personally, I. I don't agree. I think you could start by writing introduction chapter. It's an easier chapter to, to write once you know exactly what you're writing about. And the moment that you do that, you have the feeling that the, the ball is rolling, that the game is going, and it will be a good feeling and you will like it. And um, so I would suggest perhaps starting with it. And how would you do it? I would suggest you more or less follow the the structure that, I'm, that you see here on the screen. So 
first is the actual chap uh, section of introduction yeah in orange that's the main part of this chapter now the actual introduction is the key point here is to contextualize so imagine that you're writing about um, export of coffee, for example. And let's say that the reader has no idea about coffee. They have to read your introduction and know if this is a growing sector, a declining sector. If you're talking about a particular issue, when is this issue started? Um, how are they trying to tackle this issue? It's all about contextualization. Again, another comment that I often make to my students is <laughs> imagine if your grandmother's reading your thesis, right? And you're writing about whatever topic. Maybe your grandmother or your grandfather will not know a lot about this topic, but they have to read this first section of your introduction and understand the importance of it, of, of this context. You know, if it's a growing sector, if it's declining. And for you to do this, you have to bring a lot of examples, a lot of industry data that will support this contextualization. Um, also the introduction, I it's the section where usually, it's the only section where I would allow my students to um, use commercial sources, meaning, I don't know, websites such as, uh, I don't know, if there was a particular interview in the New York Times and so on, um, that's the only section that I would sort of allow because it's contextualization. Uh, literature review and so on, no, only for scientific scientific sources, okay? So after this huge contextualization, in the end, you're going to highlight what is you, you, that you're more or less trying to do. Um, then you have a 1.1, which is your personal motivation. This is a very short section. This should be, I don't know, two, three paragraphs maximum. And that's also the only section where I tell my students that it's okay to write in first person. Um, because that's just to give a little bit of background to the reader of who the author is and where you're coming from and and how you arrived at this topic and why this topic is relevant to you um, if it's a big passion how is it a passion of yours but and so this section basically you could write it in two three three paragraphs um, and you could write it in first person as well should be okay then you have your research aim and objectives um, where is the core of telling the reader what the entire document is going to be about now the research aim and objectives, we already spoke about them. You're going to lay out the uh, research aim, then the list of, of objectives. And the final part is the structure of the thesis. This section here, you can actually leave to the end, which is basically one, two paragraphs where you tell the reader um, everything that the reader will find in the following sections of your thesis. So this one you can leave to the end. Okay. So those will be, in a nutshell, my main recommendations for the introduction chapter. All right, then we move on to the literature review. Now, before we get into the literature review, let me give you an uh, initial warning. This is not going to be the most entertaining moment of your life, okay? Um, it's usually the dullest part of the project, but just think of it as like, I don't know, going to the dentist. Do we like going to the dentist? No. Do we have any choice? No. So we just do it. The literature review is the exact same thing, but perhaps it helps if you understand why you're doing it, yeah? Because it's an, actually a very important chapter. And the literature review is, uh, is very important because it shows evidence of what other people have done. Um, it sets the, the entire base for your research idea, as I'm going to explain to you. It's always good to end the, the chapter with your research gap. Now, how did you get to that research gap? You're connecting a lot of different ideas. And these different ideas that you're connecting, you're reporting them on your literature review. Um, also, later on, on your results chapter, you're going to be talking about the measurements of, I don't know, certain factors. In order for the reader to understand what those factors are, you have to have explained them before. Where do you do that? On the literature review. Yeah. So it's a very important chapter. And I know it may not be very exciting to you, but you will make it. Okay, I trust you will make it. Okay, so what are some literature review hacks that I would give to you or suggestions? First things first, remember I just explained to you the introduction chapter and I, said, and I told you it was about contextualization. So focusing on the context of your research. On the literature review, forget context. The main focus here is on theoretical concepts. You know, if, if you're, excuse me, if your work is about, um, if your work is about uh, smartphones, you're not going to be talking about smartphones in your literature review. Yeah, you're going to be talking about the theoretical concepts that you have described previously um, in your research aim. 
now it can be that um it can be that you know when you, after explaining a lot the um the concept then you you pull the discussion a little bit to your context you can do it but what i'm trying to say is that it's not your goal here to describe um your context in detail so if you're if your work for example is about i don't know social media marketing you're not going to be explaining what youtube is or what tiktok is that's what i'm trying to say okay so focus on theoretical concepts and using pretty much only scientific literature here so conference papers book chapters um journal articles if you're a master's student i would say use only journal articles um and for sure not commercial sources yeah the second thing is how to visualize your your literature review and here it's impossible for me to tell you what to do in your work because it'll be dependent on topic by topic but what i would suggest is think of it as a funnel funnel in the sense of going really broad and finishing really specific of starting with the broadest topic of your of your um of the concepts that you've defined previously and finishing up with the most specific so think of it you know as narrowing down so if you are discussing concepts like i don't know experience or culture these are very broad topics it makes sense for you to start with them and then start narrowing down and then as you narrow down in the end you have your research gap which is what you remind the reader again what your research aim is or if you want to frame it into a research question so basically you connect those those concepts from before you tie everything up yeah so this would be a good way um to do it another do's and don'ts from the literature review that i would suggest to you um i don't know if i included here on the yeah i did um so yeah so conclude the literature review by presenting the the um the research gap we already spoke about that um include only reliable scientific sources and use them wisely now what do i mean here on point four i'm using them wisely for example sometimes students will find one author that wrote one paper about something interesting and then they would just cite and cite and cite and cite um that paper until the author gets you know really tired don't do that what you're telling the the uh the um the reviewer is that like you were too lazy to look for other for other sources so you found one and that one seemed okay um so you just overused it don't do it bring as many sources as possible yeah um another form of using sources wisely is not having too many quotes um so for example when you're going through someone's literature review and there's quotes and quotes and quotes and quotes what does that mean that means that you're too lazy to read understand and paraphrase it in your own words um so try to paraphrase everything don't overuse now there's nothing wrong with using direct quotes for example if it's a definition if it's a definition then you should be using direct quotes because a definition is a definition yeah but um don't overuse quotes um the final part here point five is uh, make sure to reference them correctly so you don't run the risk of plagiarizing so if it's a direct quote make sure to include the page number always reference the author yeah um never ever ever plagiarize yeah okay and yeah just uh, reaffirming the, the 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 plagiarism warning i know that there are many different tools online and stuff like that but literally just don't do it um recently for example i had an example of a student that on the literature review there's two paragraphs that was straight taken from somewhere else at that moment i just stopped send it back to the examination office and say failed because why would i spend my time like if you didn't care like if you're plagiarizing and don't care why should i care no no reviewer will care so um so yeah i mean you know what i mean right so uh there's no need to go too much into plagiarism um some other important reminders of sources for the literature review make sure to go through um, the referencing guides there are different books for referencing guides there's one which is called cite it right there's another one called cite them right and there are plenty of explanations on different uh on different websites as to how to reference correctly with apa style or with the harvard style and, and others for the reference management software i have a list here on the screen that you can see these are really really useful 
So um, you can, every time when you download a paper, you can insert it into the software. And whenever you want to um, reference it, it adds automatically to your referencing list in the end of the document. It's really useful when you have a long document, trust me. If you use it from the beginning, you will not regret. Okay, then enough on literature review, moving on to methodology. Now, methodology is a very important chapter because it's a chapter that explains to you the rules of the game. In other words, what are all of the steps that you went through to have the results that you have later on? Um, so it's it's always important to keep in, in the back of your mind uh, of like, can someone read my methodology chapter and sort of replicate my study? If the answer is no, then your methodology is not tight enough. Um, you sh so you should describe it better. It's kind of like a recipe book, you know? What is a recipe book? It's a full description of all of the ingredients that you had, everything, every step by step of what you need to do. And if we follow the recipe book, we can, you know, finish off with that lasagna, whatever it is that you're doing. Um, here's the same thing. So can you follow all of the steps to get to those results? And also the... Um, the quality of your results, which means the quality of, of your work, will be dictated by how that data was collected. And how that data was collected will be described on your methodology. So again, can't stress enough how important this chapter is um, for you, yeah? Now, um, again, why the, take, why, why the methodology chapter is so important, I've already uh, described it, so we can sort of skip. Now, again, there's not a one size fits all, but I'd like to go through a few topics that are relevant for you to include, or at least that I would recommend that you include. Yeah. Now, the first one is research design. Was your study exploratory? Was it descriptive? Was it causal? Um, it's very important for you to describe uh, at least what is the design of what you have and why you chose that design. Now, again, uh, uh, important advice, um, the methodology of your work is not defined by you. You don't define it. Your supervisor doesn't define it. Who defines it is your research aim, is what you're trying to do. So if, you're, if your study was exploratory, if your study was um, causal and you did experiments and so on, your research aim will, will, will tell you that, yeah? will explain why that is. Um, so what you should do here is not only mention what your research design is and, and what is that research design, but very importantly, how it links to your research aim. Um, your research methods or methods, if it's a mixed design studies, for sure you should describe it. Yeah, your method. The measurements, definitely you have to include your measurements. So if you're doing a management related um, uh, thesis and, and you're measuring consumer perception, for example, don't forget to have a look at the marketing scales handbook to measure things like, um, I don't know, attitude, visual appeal, um, effective response. There's so many factors that you can measure there. And using previously validated scales, no one can say anything about the validity of your measurements. And you can test the statistical reliability of them. Yeah, So it's really, really important. And the measurements will say precisely what exactly you measured. And that's important also because the following chapter, which is your results, um, you're going to split by these factors that you that you measure. Yeah, so they're quite important. Um, point number four, sample and population. Without a doubt, you got to include them. The population, again, in a nutshell, is all of the group of possible participants within your study. The sample is the small subgroup from that population that you took, that you measured. Very important here also to describe not just the sample size, but the sampling technique. Was it a probability sampling? Was it a non-probability uh, sampling? Yeah. So how do you apply that to the population and how you gather those those um, participants? Very important. Then you have the data collection process. How did it actually happen? Was it uh, online? Was it offline? Was it only one stage? Was it was it a longitudinal studies with multiple data collection points? When did it start? When did it end? All of those are very important. Validity and reliability. You should absolutely discuss it in your thesis. Now it's beyond the scope of this video to explain what validity or reliability are. Um, so if you're not sure, go and have a look. Yeah. But um, validity, again, if you're using previously validated scales, no one can say anything because they've been validated. The reliability, you can actually measure your Kronbach alpha, for example. Um, if you're doing qualitative studies, different one. But nevertheless, address them, okay? 
Um, and there are some other sections which you could include depending on what your work is. For example, instruments or equipment. Um, if you're doing, let's say, an experiment and you're using, I don't know, with virtual reality, you have to describe what is the equipment, you know, what is the model of that VR. If you're doing a, um, a product testing, what was the product, what was the version of that product, and so on. And if it was an experiment, you should also inc include the experimental procedure and also detailing the manipulation of your independent variable, the dependence you have on measurements before. Okay? So those are some of the main topics that I would suggest. Common question that I have from students, should I do a mixed design? In other words, should I do a combination of descriptive with exploratory or exploratory with causal? Um, my view on that is that a research problem, it's kind of like a three-dimensional statue. You can look at from different angles. If you're doing a mixed design, you're looking at that problem from different perspectives. And obviously, if you look at a statue from more angles, you're having a better view of what that statue is. So if you have time, if you have resources, um, it's always interesting. And also if it makes sense, obviously, to your research aim, it's always a good approach to do because it gives you a more holistic overview or understanding of that problem that you have. Okay. But that's a discussion between you and your supervisor. I'm just giving my personal impression on that. Okay, so having finished the uh, methodology where you described step by step on what you did to get your results, then we come to the results chapter, yeah? All right, now, how do you report your results well? Um, first of all, remind the reader in the beginning of the chapter what your research aim was, yeah? Remember, I've mentioned this at, at, at the start, don't let the reader get lost. So make sure that you're always emphasizing um, what the uh, the aim of your study is. After you, you're reminded of what your study is, then you're going to structure the chapter well, making it easy to follow. For example, on your methodology, we just talked about it, where you have your section of measurements, you listed all of the things that you measured, right? So let's say that you measured, I don't know, four factors like attitude or risk or whatever. Then you're going to put the, 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 the subsections, 3.11, analysis of attitude, 3.12, analysis of risk, and so on. So it's really separated. The worst thing that you could do is just have a body of text where the reader doesn't know where the analysis of one factor ends or where it, where, where it starts or where it ends, and it's really confusing to follow. And once again, if the reader gets lost or confused, it will compromise how your work is perceived, okay? So make sure to um, structure it well. The other thing is reporting your statistical resort results accurately. What do I mean exactly uh, here? Um, when you do, for example, an analysis on SPSS, which is the software that I mostly work with, in every output, there's a lot more information than what you actually sometimes need. First thing, never ever copy and paste a table from a software output into your work, yeah? Because um, you should only include what you can and will explain. You don't want to go to your colloquium to your, to your oral presentation or when you're doing a consulting project or working at your company and then you present some results and someone says, uh, excuse me, that sounds really interesting, but could you explain me that value over there? And you say, uh, I have no clue, I have no idea. Um, you don't want to do that. So report what you can and what you will explain, what is relevant to your study, and make sure that you create your own tables, never copy and pasting anything. For different tests, chi-square, an ANOVA, correlation, regression, whatever the test is, there's a bit of a structure to report within the text. And for this, I would um, recommend to you an uh, extraordinary author, at least in my view, which is, his name is Andy Field. Andy Field, Andy with a Y in the end. And he's a professor, if I'm not wrong, of child psychology at the University of Sussex. And, um, but his main publication is called um, Discovering Statistics. And then there's a SPSS version, there's a SAS version, there's an R version. And in all of his books, he shows really clearly how to accurately report statistical results. So I would strongly recommend um, you do that, okay? 
Um, number four, I've mentioned this already uh, previously, create your own tables and label them properly, you know, make them look good, more or less with the same size, never copy from a statistics software, and especially not from those online survey platforms, okay? That's gonna kill your work. Um, number five, don't overuse direct quotes if you're doing qualitative results. Again, beyond the scope of this video to explain how to do qualitative analysis, but you should have quotes from participants if they're a great example to exemplify that theme that you have identified. But what you don't want to be doing is just posting um, uh, quotes and quotes and quotes and quotes of respondents thinking that it's a qualitative analysis. That's not the way to report it. And finally, if your page count allows, it's always good to have a table that summarizes all of your findings. Again, it's a way to help the reader visualize what you have found. So let's say if you had a causal study and you tested a number of hypotheses, um, then you can have a table with all of your hypotheses and mentioning which ones were rejected, which ones were supported. If you had uh, a qualitative analysis, what were the main themes that you have identified and what they mean? Excuse me. Um, if you had a um, any other form of quantitative analysis, what were some of the main um, findings that you had? Yeah, it's always good to finish up with a bit of a summary in a um, in a table. Okay, so after you you've done that, then you go into your conclusions uh, chapter, or sometimes often called the discussions uh, chapter. I know that sometimes people do it together with the results chapter. Again, there's not a single formula. These are just my personal recommendations to you. I like when the conclusions is separate because the conclusion is when you go in depth in your thoughts as how you reflect on your findings. Yeah. And the main question that you have to answer in your conclusions chapter is, so what? You found that consumers or company or companies are doing this or are doing that and so on and so on. Okay. But as the title of the beautiful track by Miles Davis says, so what? what yeah so the 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 main mistake that you could do in your conclusions chapter is thinking that it's a summary of your results it's not so never ever ever write your conclusions chapter as if it's a summary of your results it's not the results you write in the results chapter so what is exactly then the conclusions chapter and what you should do now before we go into in, we get into the actual detail there's a first uh, something i wanted to mention first normally when students get to the conclusions chapter, their energy level is going down. They've already been working on that thesis for quite a while. They conceptualized, they did the literature review, they collected the data, they analyzed the data. Now energy level is going down. If you feel like your energy level is going down, have a break, shut off your computer, go for a walk, take a day off, let you regain energy. Because this is a very important chapter on the sense that it allows the reader to know how you reflect on what you have found, you know, and the depth of your thoughts as you reflect on your results and how you contrast it with the existing literature. So my first suggestion, take a break. Once you regain your energy, um, then the second one is highlight the main contribution of your work. Why, is your, why are your findings relevant? Well, how are they relevant to the existing literature? So contrasting it with the existing literature? Did they confirm the existing literature? Did they contradict the existing literature? Did they highlight new possibilities or new areas of research? Um, which of the results were expected? Which ones were unexpected? Yeah. Um, and also it's a moment for you to have your personal reflection. The, the reader should read your conclusions chapter and understand how you position yourself in relation to the results that you have found. Okay, that's also really important. So contrast it with the existing literature, highlight their importance, and also provide your personal reflection, your personal views on your findings. Then you have your research limitations, which sometimes in some theses is the penultimate uh, uh, chapter, sometimes it's the final chapter. Um, at least for me as a supervisor, it doesn't really matter if it's the penultimate or the, the last one, okay? Um, one first thing on limitations. Every, every single study has limitations. So don't be concerned, don't be afraid of mentioning what your limitations are, yeah? Um, 
sometimes and and not just students sometimes uh well-rounded academics they sort of try to put the limitations of their studies under the rug a little bit and i think that's terrible because when you highlight the limitations essentially what you're telling the uh the reader is these are the results but you should interpret them in light or considering these factors here that are potential limitations to this study so essentially what you're saying is that you have a much more holistic overview of your findings and um and at least to me to see this in students is is great you know again every single study will have limitations doesn't matter what the study um is okay so um a limitation will be anything that can hinder your finding or your study and if your study has limitations it does not mean that your study is useless it is very useful in light of the understanding of what the limitations are okay now what could be possible research limitations for example sample size if you didn't have you know a lot of respondents if you did a qualitative study and you know with very few people or if you did a descriptive study and the sample size was not big enough or the profile of the sample so for example this you will find a lot of studies that are mostly done with a student sampling simply because gathering students in universities as participants is easy now if you're having all of your respondents uh, all all of your participants in a case of experiments more or less with the same demographic more or less with the same age level of education and so on of course that's going to limit the external validity of your of your findings um, so that can be a limitation the method that you apply um, can also be um, a limitation also together with the data collection process for example um, let's say that you are researching a very um sensitive topic like about um i don't know uh, the consumption of hygiene products or um drug use or something to do with people's um financial situation we don't want to look if and let's say that the method is an in-person interview we don't want to look bad so to say with the person who is interviewing us so we can sort of change our answers and that can be a limitation so if you want to ask people about their drug use during music festivals it's unlikely that they're going to be really open and honest if you're asking them face to face because they're right there yeah so sometimes the method and how the data is collected might be a, um, a limitation the equipment so let's say that you are again going to the example of experiments with virtual reality if the vr goggles is too old or if they don't have a certain feature that can be a limitation um time um if the study was done too quickly or if the, uh, the questionnaire was too long all of this can be a limitation the timing of the study so for example if you collected your data a week before carnival for example or a week before christmas people's minds are elsewhere um so depending on when you do it it might pose an, an effect um financial resources if you don't have enough money to to you know conduct the study in a certain way where, where you would like access to literature sometimes different universities have access to some journals but not others an age of data so if you're using secondary data the data has been collected too long in the past um, that can be a limitation um as well okay so these are some examples of of limitations that you could include of obviously that there are others um my personal view don't be shy in mentioning the limitations of your study it's only going to highlight that you know what you're doing and that you think holistically and um and at least for me as, as a supervisor is something which i i like to see in the students and to finish uh to finish up the, the the chapters is how to write the managerial recommendations now the managerial recommendations is when you tell the the reader or the companies or the industry right what they should do in view of your results um so it's like you went to the doctor now the doctor's telling you what pill to take and how often to take that pill it's more or less the same yeah um what are some of the things once again this is very often it's a very final chapter like the conclusion chapter that i told you if you feel like you are tired breathe and rest before you start okay um this should be very end and very often we we see thesis and it's just it reads so rushed yeah so you don't want to have that 
after you've done it and you start working on your recommendations, develop recommendations only that are only based on your findings. You can have great ideas, but if your ideas are not related to what you measured, you can't really propose them. It's like um, like a weird metaphor um, that I give to students sometimes. It's like imagine if you go to the doctor and then the doctor and then you say, "Well, I'm having this terrible problem in my knee," and the doctor says, "Oh, great! Um, you should do something on your elbows." Like what that has nothing to do you looked at my knee um it's the same thing so if you measured a certain aspect your recommendations have to be related to that you know so it's always good to highlight based on what finding you are proposing um you're basing that re that recommendation the third factor is feasibility considers all the financial and non-financial return of that of that implementation you can have a great idea but if the trade-off between investment and in return is not um, is not valuable one, then that's not really a feasible idea. And also feasibility in the sense of operationalization. Will it take too long to implement? Um, will it need too much financial resources or or time? Yeah. So those are things to consider. So considering the implementation process. The fifth one is originality. So how original this idea is. You don't want to have go through the entire process of your thesis, and then what something that you're recommending, something obvious or basic that you would need to do a study for that. Um, so consider the originality. And very often, the ideas that we have for recommendations, they come from, you know, uh, from other fields. So be open to having a look at other, other fields and what these uh, um, uh, tactics are and how you can potentially get inspired by some of these and apply to your own yeah and finally the relevance of the problem that you're trying to solve make sure that the recommendations are actually based on a relevant problem because essentially they're going to become more valuable yeah and that's what we want is to have recommendations that will deliver value to organizations all right and to um to uh finish up how to prepare for the presentation so you did your entire work and now you submitted your work and now you're going to present to the reviewers you're going to present to the supervisors and what are some of the do's and don'ts that i would uh, that i would suggest um to you first of all um after you submit read the entire thesis yeah that's a really important one um it will be some time since you submitted and you don't want to submit and having forgotten a few things um, so make sure that you read it Second, make a killer presentation. If you are submitting your thesis, that means you concluded your entire program. And if you concluded your entire program, you should have, have developed these soft skills in making nice, visually appealing PowerPoints, um, uh, you know, and presenting yourself in a nice way, yeah? Um, knowing how to handle your hands during presentations. Um, and another thing for the killer presentation that I would recommend only discuss the main chapters, main, main main points in each chapter of your thesis. Because for example, the, the supervisor and the reviewers, they will have read your work. So you don't want to explain every single thing again. Yeah. Um, so make sure that you, uh, that you address the key points. Also address the negative issues in the thesis. Like after reading, you will know where the gaps are. When you're presenting, address them before the reviewers address them. You know, that's always a good thing. So it's a it's a defense mechanism that it, it normally works. So if you address the negative issues before the reviewers will raise them. Having visually appealing slides, you know that. Um, printing the slides and giving them to the panel. If your presentation is in person, it doesn't take too much to print your slides and, and give them to the, to the reviewers there. Not necessarily they're going to use them. But again, it shows that you care. It shows that you had attention to detail. And those things really, really count. Yeah. Um, another thing, keep track of time. Yeah. If you only have 15 minutes, if you have 20 minutes, if you have how many minutes in your institution, practice, practice, practice. Yeah. And this is a very important skill to have. When I go to an academic conference, normally we have 15 minutes. I cannot say, oh, my study is so amazing and I need 45 minutes. No, you've got 15 because everybody else has 15 as well. So we all need to, to practice it, yeah? And have a professional mindset. 
yeah, very professional mindset. So dress up well, posture, always good. Okay, then regarding to the questions, how to answer the questions. Normally, typically, there are three types of questions that you're going to face. One are questions that you have to know the answer to because are questions about your work, about how you analyzed, and so on. And those questions that you must know the answer to, those you just hit them out of the park. Yeah. Then there's some questions that where you might know, uh, which are not exactly what you did, you know, but are related to your topic, where you can say, well, I'm not exactly sure, but considering this and considering that, I will believe that, you know, that you could do this or you could do that. Um, so you could answer, but making sure that, you know, within those boundaries. And there are some questions that you don't know the answer to, yeah, um, which often reviewers or supervisors will ask them to know if you're just making up stuff. If you don't know, say that you don't know. Yeah, none of us know everything. And in science and in research, it's very important to know how to say no, or to say that uh, you don't know. Yeah, it's, it's very important. And we only advance when we don't know things, and then we try to figure them out. So um, there's no there's no problem in, in saying that you don't know if it's something not related exactly to your work and so on. Okay. Um, fourth point, be humble. Now, it seems a bit silly to be mentioning this, but I've had so many examples of students who come to the colloquium with the attitude as if they know everything and you know that their topic is, is so you know they're gonna win the Nobel Prize and look on on the bachelor's maybe I thought I knew a lot in my master's I figured out I didn't know much in my PhD I completely accepted that I know hardly anything yeah so um, it's always good to have a humble attitude a curious attitude rather than overconfident yeah there's a lot of examples where that doesn't go too well. Um, another suggestion, have your thesis with you, physically or digitally. It's not nice when the reviewer took the time to go through your thesis and says, by the way, here on page 35, could you please, and then you don't have your work with you. Um, that That's really not good. Yeah, so make sure you have the thesis with you. The next one, have your presentation file available in different locations. Sometimes it happens, one file is corrupted and so on. Um, it doesn't take too much to email yourself um, to have, you know, different, I don't know, pen drives or whatever you want it, but have the file in different locations. And the last one, enjoy. Yeah, a smile. Smile is an international communication. Everybody understands a smile. You did your entire work. Now you're presenting it. Yeah, so make sure to enjoy the moment, regardless of where you're studying, most likely it is your last moment in that institution. So enjoy the moment, yeah? Every study will have flaws, or most studies will have flaws. Almost every study will have limitations. Uh, it is the, the, the job of the reviewer to be picky on things. Some will be over picky, some less, you know? Don't let that ruin your moment and um, enjoy. Enjoy because life goes by really fast. And when I look back in some of the colloquiums that I have had as student, um, perhaps I could have enjoyed a little bit more some of them. But sometimes that's how it goes. Yeah. But my suggestion to you: smile and, uh, and try to enjoy it. So, my friends, when, when when you go through all of those, you will reach life after thesis. You will be done. And if you had a uh, a good experience. It might feel like in you know a sense of emptiness, um, um, you know, and uh, and weirdly enough, if you like the experience, you might want to do it again. You might want to go back to the start as a uh, Coldplay sings with uh, with the scientist. I remember that when I when I finished my my masters, I really dedicated myself to to that thesis. I was still in Brazil and. Um, and I was so fascinated by the mental challenge, but only because I was involved in a topic that at the time I was passionate about. So if you're gonna have a good experience or a bad experience, will be a lot dictated by how passionate you are for the topic that you chose. Don't choose a topic just for choosing. You're gonna be wasting your time, and um, and that's not that's not a good decision. That's not a good way, a good way to go. So try to choose. Um, something that you enjoy, that you feel passionate about, that you see a sense of purpose, that you find relevance, 
then it's really a deep dive into that topic and um and you're going to enjoy it and you're going to appreciate it and when you conclude it you might want to say actually i want to go a step further i want to go to my to my to my masters or i want to go to my phd or you know and afterwards see what you will do okay um just before i go if you need help with statistics also on live innovation there's two different e-guides or e-books that i wrote together with the colleague of mine Zilke Yuta and you can download them for free as well on live innovation also there's a SPSS um, video tutorial from introduction to the software all the way until I don't know Manova or some advanced um, more advanced analysis and from time to time I'll try to add new ones whenever I have whenever I have time okay so thank you very much if you're watching this video still so congratulations you're really a warrior um so thank you very much uh, i'd love if you could leave a comment in the end um if you appreciate it if the ebook or this video or the series or whatever was somehow useful to you and i always appreciate when the students or whoever's watching this writes where in the world you are what country you are it's always a uh, a nice thing that i always like i always appreciate to know where people where people are okay so my dear friends uh, those are my recommendations based on the sounds like a thesis ebook a short summary of everything a bit of a commentary on each of the different uh chapters i hope it was useful i wish you a beautiful beautiful day all the absolute best take care and bye bye <laughs>